So uh, thank you very much for joining us thank you. and being here with us. Uh, we will have a short introduction uh, at the beginning and continue with a kind of conversation in which you're all uh, very much invited to join. So, Edith, please. Hello. Uh, I'm sorry I don't speak Croatian, so this has to be in English. Um, uh, thank you for coming. It's you know, it's very moving to see you that this place is packed. I wouldn't expect that, actually. Um, well, coming from an interesting country helps a person. I'm like, even if you're the most boring person on the planet, you know, your country <laughs> saves you from being boring because everything is happening in Turkey at the moment, and you all know that. I've been talking about what's happening in Turkey since years, and it's extremely tiring, uh, incredibly depressing business to do. Uh, but now I don't have to because everybody knows and it's all over the papers on international media. Therefore, I spare myself talking about Turkey every day, which is a nice thing to do. Today I'm here to talk about writing and politics, literature and politics, right? Odnos is literature? Relationship. Relationship. Uh, writing and politics. Writing and politics. Uh, when I thought about what, what to say about writing and politics, or literature of what and politics, um, two stories came to my mind, which I've been through uh, 20 year, more than 20 years ago, and very recently. Um, I was a journalist, as you might know, um, and I became a journalist when I was 20 years old, uh, as a poor girl. Um, and it was a very hard job to do. Uh, firstly, it was a ma male-dominated, you know, sphere, as you would assume. And I was working for the oldest newspaper of Turkey, Cumhuriyet, uh, which is, by the way, now under spotlight because of uh, many journalists who have been imprisoned from that newspaper. Uh, and I worked, I started working for Cumhuriyet in 1993, which is last century. And um, I was 20 and I was working on po uh, pu uh, po mothers of political prisoners. Uh, that is something that nobody wants to do uh, in a newspaper. Therefore, if you're the youngest one, they send you for these news that they w will probably not publish. So um, I was following political uh, mothers of political prisoners on a daily basis and I was writing about them, and they weren't publishing it, or they were publishing it in a very tiny news. So it went on forever, and it was, the job was already depressing, and so on and so forth, so I decided I am resigning, as if, if, no, as if, somebody, as if anybody cares about me. So I said, I am resigning, and say, okay, go. Um, and I kissed everyone, and you know, said hello, and that was supposed to be the last day of my journalism in 1993. But then, uh, these mothers, uh, in Ankara, there is this certain flower, which is like a um, um, tulip. And all these mothers that I did the news of, and by the way, those news you know, rarely appeared on paper, they came with these tulips in their hands to the paper. While I was just trying to get out of the door, they were getting in to the newspaper. So one of the very talented, very experienced journalists in the in the newsroom saw me, you know, with these mothers. I stopped when I see that I saw them. And you know, when he saw me, he said, Go on, make news, this is journalism. So this is why I kept on doing journalism. When you look at it, it is, I think, both an emotional and a political story. And politics has always been quite emotional to me. It's about emotions. It has always been so. People tend to think that politics is something hardcore, uh, or you know, it's mostly real politics uh, about parties, about I don't know, parliamentarians, about who said what, and so on and so forth. But I see politics as something that determines my life personally and determines writing as well. So this was how, uh, when I started the job, uh, how politics determined my life. It kept me in journalism. 
just because of those mothers. And they were quite political women. I don't know where politics st uh, stand in this story or where writing stand, but I think they are mostly intertwined. And lately I wrote another novel, uh, which is not published in Croatia, but it will be published in English and in German very soon. It's called Time of Mute Swans. Uh, the story is about 1980 military coup that happened in Turkey, and the story goes on, it takes place in Ankara, the capital city of Turkey, which nobody talks about, everybody knows Istanbul, but nobody actually knows about Ankara. And um, it's about two kids trying to rescue swans from the top general of the army. Um, it is based on a true story, actually, and this true story goes something like this. After the military coup, during the military coup, I'm sorry, in 1980, the top general of the coup um, makes a decision. And this decision is about a park in Ankara. Ankara is in the middle of Anatolia, and in the middle of, in the center of Ankara, there's a park. And there are swans in this park. So the top general of the military coup uh, decides that uh, Ankara needs another park, another park with swans. So he takes some of the, he you know orders people to take some of the swans and to put them in another park. And they they, they do this, and the swans all of a sudden they don't want to stay in the second park, which was ordered by the military uh, commander. And they try to go back to their original park, which is Kulu Park, which means a uh, park with the swans in the center of Ankara. While trying, they were trying to fly back to their original park. They hit the buildings and they broke their, they, they were dead, basically, most of them. So uh, as the true story goes, the top general of the military says that these swans should be operated and this particular bone in their wings should be removed so they cannot fly anymore. Today in Ankara, there are still swans in this park and they cannot fly. And people even forgot that swans could fly once. So my story was about Turkey becoming like today. And uh, you know, the, the, the swan story <coughs> was in the middle of this. So um, one can say that this is a, a very you know, tiny detailed story or one can you know, establish a, uh, a complete novel on this very political, little, tiny story. So this is how I see politics. It's in the story. It's everywhere, but it's mostly in the story, in the tiniest story you can think of. Um, I'm writing politics. I have been writing pol politics, real politics, for 20 years. And I'm not doing that anymore. I am writing novels and mostly literature, except for this one book I wrote. Turkey, The Insane of Melancholy. Um, it's published in German, in, it's going to be in French, it's in English already, and it's going to be even in Taiwan soon. I don't know what they're going to, why they're reading about Turkey, but they do. Um, <clears throat> uh, except for that, I'm not writing politics anymore. Um, today, as of today, I was telling, uh, as of today, I, write, I started writing a Turkey diary for a Swiss newspaper called Woz. And I'm going to be writing my own experience about Turkey and what's happening in Turkey. And um, I think there is no life beyond politics or out of politics. But then uh, being over politicized as we are in Turkey right now uh, is an extremely disturbing situation because it does not only polarize the political sphere but it also um, creates a clash in between system of values. Um, I think this is my intro. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We somehow uh, sketched the platform uh, of the themes we were going to go through this evening. But maybe uh, we should go back to the journalism part yeah. <laughs> from at the beginning. Uh, you were once most read 
columnist that was a long time ago. And, but you moved from journalism more towards literature and somehow found a shelter there. So what is journalism offering uh, and literature doesn't and vice versa? <coughs> Well, the story seems like that from outside, but actually it's not. Um, I was born into a political family. My mother was uh, Maoist. My father was a socialist democrat. So uh, I was born into politics. I didn't know how not to live with, you know, how to live without politics. I, I, I thought that everybody was leftist. Nobody believed in God and so on and so forth for such a <laughs> quite a long time. Um, and. But then, you know, uh, a bit different from my generation, I was raised with literature. I wasn't indoctrinated by my parents, but rather I was made to read literature. Um, um, so I am coming from literature, and journalism for 20 years was somewhat something that I did, that I was, in a way. Um, on the other hand, I do think that um, all writing is poem. Actually, it's poetry. Uh, it depends on how much you dilute it with other things, with reality. If you put too much reality in it, in it, in it, it becomes journalism. And then if you put less reality in it, or some other sort of reality, so to speak, it becomes a novel, maybe. But in its core, all writing is poetry to me. And um, what, is different, what is the difference between journalism and novel? I think it's the difference between reality and truth. And um, truth does not always soothe you, but obviously my reality, our reality in Turkey is not, uh, is not the most you know, safe haven, haven of uh, intellectual thinking. Um, being too much politicized is um, paralyzing one's intellectual capacity. This is, this is a funny thing, if you ask me, um, because once you're politicized, when you're, uh, and if you define yourself in the opposition, and if the po political power is becoming more and more uh, oppressive uh, or primitive, you, uh, being the opposing voice, you are becoming accordingly primitive. Uh, very recently, actually a few days ago, um, the government uh, pushed a motion in the parliament saying that the minors can uh, can be married to their rapists. Yeah, yeah it's a very complicated uh, thing. The law does not sound like this, but actually the, the outcome of the law is this. They wanted to marry the minor girls to the those people who raped them. And the even more disgusting is uh, the part of it is that if a girl is raped by 10 people, so to speak, which is not uncommon in Turkey, uh, if one of them gets married to this girl, the other nine is freed as well. So, so as, you know, as the opposition, what do you do? You say, don't get the girls married to their rapists, which is a horrible thing to say, which is almost disgusting. I cannot even say this, it's nauseating. Uh, but then, you know, as the political power becomes more and more primitive, those people who are becoming, who are on the oppositions, are uh, entitled, are almost obliged to become more primitive as well. That's why being over politicized, uh, over living in an over politicized country, is kind of sickening and intellectually paralyzing. And again, back to journalism and literature. Literature gives you some sort of, you know, relatively safe haven for to think otherwise, to think about uh, deeper things or you know higher things, whatever you call it, uh, than only for only than only saying no to things that happen to you that happen to you or around you. Mm. And uh, could we also consider it as a kind of uh, safety glove in the, this relationship between journalism and literature in this uh, time of uh, high repression and uh, the ban of freedom of speech that is happening in uh, Turkey currently. <coughs> mm -hmm. So that somehow you can use a, di a different form in order to 
communicate and pass the information and values <coughs> that are somehow uh, restricted in the journalistic case. Well, yes or no? Uh, yes and no, actually. Uh, yes, it does, because one has to read the whole book to, uh, to say no, uh, which is not common, common <coughs> among the uh, government supporters. But then no, because uh, one of our best known novelists in the prison now, Asla Erdogan, who is a friend of mine as well, and a linguist, Najmi Alfai, you know, if you're talking about safe law, being a linguist is the safest position, you would think, but then she's in prison. And uh, so, you know, this, uh, the total unpredictability of the political situation uh, can, um, might, you know, capture anyone for any reason uh, in any way. Therefore, nothing is safe in that regard. But if you are not talking about only about Turkey, in, you're talking in general, yes, you know, literature gives you sort of uh, coded language in a way, not very known to the, mm, in quotation, commons. Uh, but in Turkey, no, no, it does not. N not nothing is safe in that regard. But that also brings us to the theme of uh, the current situation in Turkey and the media freedom. So we're uh, following, in the past, especially in the past months, since the coup, uh, the huge attack on all kinds of freedom and media are especially, especially threatened mm -hmm. uh, by it. Can you maybe sketch also how, how, how the information passed now? How, what's going on? Is there any kind of... <laughs> Opposition and reaction to uh, this kind of destabilization, one of the pillars of democracy. Mm -hmm. Well, inf information does not pass. <laughs> Full stop. This is the situation. Um, okay, only today these things happen in Turkey. The most prominent figure in Kurdish politics, who is 74, Ahmed Turk, has been imprisoned. Uh, Syria, Assad forces attacked Turkey two times during the day. Therefore, there is a serious um, possibility that Turkey might get into war, real one. Uh, Turkish lira is descending like crazy. So economic crisis is at our doorstep. And what else? Something else happened as well. Oh yeah, European Union froze the accession toll, uh, toll to Turkey. This is our normal day. There, there's a joke uh, today on Twitter about Turkey. There's this breaking news uh, template on Twitter. Uh, it's called Son Dakika in Turkish. And somebody wrote, foreign people think that this is our national flag. <laughs> <laughs> so this is it. Like, you know, every 15 minutes, something shocking is happening. It's almost like, you know, we are going through this shock and awe period. It's constantly. And it's, it's impossible to follow the news. It's in, well, even if you follow the news, it's impossible to keep your sanity. Uh, because all these things you say when you, you know, all these things happening, uh, those things that when you hear, it's like, you, this cannot be. And it, it, it does, you know, every 15 minutes. Uh, so it is psychologically uh, extremely disturbing. Uh, information, therefore does not pass anymore. It's, uh, well, information maybe, but then uh, in-depth analysis or, you know, understanding things, these are becoming impossible, not only because of the oppression, but also the, the speed of events, the speed of incidents. It, it, it makes it impossible to grasp the meaning of it. Uh, this is one part of it. And it's very easy to say that there is an oppressive government and is oppressed, there is no freedom of expression, and so on and so forth, which is completely true. But then um, Croatia and other European countries should take a closer look to this as well. Uh, media has not been really doing its job either. It lost its uh, trust, you know, public trust. And this goes, I think this, this argument can be uh, applied to anywhere in the world at the moment. The capital and media coming together, emerging, uh, you know, becoming one, intertwined, you know, made journalists 
uh, lose their lose the trust they have built throughout the years. So it was very easy for an, it was and it still is it's very easy for an oppressor uh, to to say that these guys are telling lies and everybody would uh, you know believe him rather than the media, which is now done by Trump as well. Um, I'm telling Trump because now everybody sees what we are going through in Turkey. It's so alike. It's incredibly similar. Uh, and I think Europe will be seeing the same things as well. Um, it's, everybody talks about this rising uh, right wing and so on and so forth. But I think it is more than that. It's, I, 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 I'd like to call it mobilization of organized ignorance. And it's going to be everywhere very soon. Uh, so yeah, uh, information does not pass, but we, not it's not the only reason. The oppressors' um, oppression is not the only reason at all. There are, there's a lot to it that we can talk up, talk about, especially post-truth situation, post-trust situation, and so on and so forth. There are not sexy names for this. But this remains uh, a um, uh, title of an article uh, published in New York Times or Independent, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, right after the, the elections in the US, when they said that they will uh, start publishing uh, better informed articles <laughs> from now on, which is like an irony. In a way, mm, uh, confessing the capitulation of the journalism. Uh, yeah, even Christina Amanpour was saying today that you know we have to do better journalism and so on and so forth. It's so you know coming from those names, it's quite ironic. Yeah. But maybe we could continue on this track uh, when you're mentioning the rise of uh, right wing uh, movements and parties in uh, Europe, and uh, some in somehow Turkey is. Uh, in a, in a core of uh, many uh, intertwinings and uh, meetings of different cultural traditions and politics and religions and so many, it was considered also in a way a barrier for the, between Western and Eastern world in a way and this destabilization that is happening currently in Turkey uh, and also dynamics that are happening within the country can also uh, show us somehow the perspective of our future here in the Western world, which was, uh, uh, as one uh, right man said, it, uh, in, uh, in too long period of peace, which you can gratify mm -hmm. something we didn't deserve. Um, the popular joke in Turkey was, for years, or, or I don't know, before Gezi and after Gezi, which happened in 2013, the you know the national uprising in a way, the popular joke was that they are running the aliens are running a full scale you know massive scale experiment on Turkey, and we are the guinea pigs. Although it was a joke, uh, although there are no aliens running an experiment on Turkey, there sure was an experiment. And it's called, you know, the, the Turkish model, which did not only influence, like, affect uh, the Middle Eastern countries, but also some Balkan countries as well. Um, and we were the guinea pigs uh, of this experiment. And now, you know, after seeing Trump elected, by the way, I thought, oh yeah, this was why they were running an experiment in Turkey. They're going to apply it for U.S. Um, well, Turkish model was based on the idea that there can be a perfect marriage between political Islam and democracy, and that would that it would fit perfectly well for the Middle Eastern countries. And one, there is no moderate Islam, I guess. Second, American way of democracy does not, you know, save people from uh, oppression, obviously, as we saw in Turkey. Um, but what is similar to the rest of the uh, right-wing rising countries, let's say, is this funny detail. In, in every country, you know, as far as I saw, uh, in, even in Britain, uh, it starts with the same question uh, getting very popular. And the question is, 
Why do we ask the experts? We are real people of this country and democracy belongs to us. So we know the best. So it is not only right wing rising, but also it is, a, I think, a full scale war on global level to intellect itself. This is very worrying. This is very frightening, I think, because then it becomes, you know, uh, these, all these masses, mobilized, ignorant masses, are becoming you know, food soldiers against the intellect. Not intellectuals, not leftists, the intellect itself, the thought, the, the information, whatever you call it. And this has been ruining the sphere of discussion uh, and public sphere in Turkey for the last decade. Because a normal discussion, not, you know, in a normal discussion, you clash your arguments, right? Because this is rational. You follow a rational um, path. But then when you talk to a government supporting person, it's like you know, playing chess with a pigeon. Uh, you say something, and then he says completely, something completely different. And then you go, huh? And then you lose. Because he says, you don't know anything. You cannot say anything. But you know, I cannot even give an example. It's so stupid. It is schizophrenic, even. Um, OK, about the last uh, law that I was speaking about, this in, in minors getting married to the rapists. When you say that you cannot do this because uh, consent of a minor, there is no consent of the minor. Uh, and then he goes, so you are against family. Huh? You see, this is how it goes. It's not you are not. Um, it's not you are in on different levels, but you're on different spheres. <laughs> see, so this is going to happen here in Paris, in London, everywhere, because this is a global thing happening. Trump is doing the same thing at the moment. You're, I, I'm sure you're following it. All of a sudden, he says something. Everybody goes, huh? But then. He, he has supporters and his support is rising because that sort of um, uh, mobilized ignorance catches so quickly because it's not sophisticated and one can, you know, if he doesn't want to learn, if he doesn't want to be sophisticated, one can empathize it, uh, with it very, very quickly. So this is the new problem of, to, uh, of, 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 of our globe, I think. And we don't know how to, you know, protect the intellect, because uh, intellectuals uh, or you know mainstream intellectuals, let's say mainstream media, mainstream intellectuals have been so hypocrite that people don't like them anymore, don't trust them anymore. Therefore, uh, it's not easy to protect the intellect, to protect the media, and so on and so forth. So, so I think we are paying our for our <coughs> earlier sins as well as intellectuals and journalists. And um, in uh, your book, uh, Turkey, uh, the Insane and the Melancholy, uh, which was published a year ago, you are uh, describing the situation in Turkey and this uh, authoritarian system <laughs> that is more and more imposing on the society. Uh, but you also are expressing uh, in it a certain kind of hope that uh, there are some movements, such as Gezi Park, uh, which was pretty well followed in Croatian media, actually, uh, and that, that there is uh, this social tissue that still can oppose uh, what's going on. But um, it's now a year since the book is published, and uh, that year saw coup d'etat in uh, the summer and uh, many people, intellectuals, academics, journalists, politicians imprisoned, uh, do you still cherish this hope or is it deteriorating? I have this great answer to these questions and I memorize it and I'll keep repeating <laughs> it because it saves me from a real answer. Uh, it's like it goes like you know I don't like the word hope I, I believe in the word determination blah 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 it's, it's a very nice answer but I'm not repeating it this time um, um, the book was published one year one yeah one 
more than a year even. Uh, first in Germany and in September it was published in London uh, and in New York. Um, and my publisher published the book 10 days after the coup in England. And now the French publisher asks me to write an intro for uh, you know, t telling about the coup. And I'm trying to escape from that because it's not easy because uh, you know my hopes are dying, obviously, like many other people. Um, you know, think about a country where there's, uh, you know, I told you about the things that happen only today, and they did not end, by the way. It can happen. You know, things can still happen to, throughout the night, and this country is, uh, it's something like. You know, you go to bed uh, for the things that have been done in the country uh, and being mortified because of them, although you didn't do anything. And then you wake up and think, my God, what have they done again to embarrass me, to mortify me, to you know, disturb me, and so on. So it's a constant, ongoing shocks and traumas. Uh, it's not easy to be hopeful. Uh, on the other hand, this last motion about the minors getting married to their rapists, it was stopped by women of Turkey. Full stop. And I think this was uh, the first time after Gezi, in Gezi protests that uh, people really managed to stop something. Although they, at the end they stopped you know, something very disgusting but then they stopped it so i do believe in women of turkey because they are the ones who are uh, damaged by the current situation most and they are the ones true um, defenders of modern society and i do believe in them i seriously do and even the daughter of the president actually was against the law which was very interesting yeah but, um, in a sense, the, where do you see uh, the, the platforms? The uh, how how are contemporary movements organized, and uh, where can we see? Because from a Turkish perspective, probably looking at things since okay, we are at the bottom. There is no help, so please let's try to struggle. But for societies that are not yet hit but are in the process of uh, getting a coup of a certain type uh, may, it's probably current moment now is the time to mobilize now, now is the time to, to organize and rethink politics relations media education mobilization everything and how, how do you see this network knitted in uh, Turkey how is it? Growing and how is it mobilizing? What are what are what are, what are the, the, the cohesive uh, points? Well, this might not sound very cute now, but um, you, I think I should say it. There are two uh, concepts that people and we all together have to think about: one, civil society; second, identity politics. The civil society thing has been very much overrated. And what happened to Turkey is because of that, unfortunately. Because it, you know, everybody believed in the, no the intellectuals, liberal intellectuals believed in the notion that if you give them all the rights, all the laissez-faire, laissez-faire thing to civil society, then democracy will occur automatically, which was not the case. If you do this and you end up with those people who are defending the idea that minors should get, should get married to their rapists. This is our civil society. So this one side, I'm, I'm just you know, getting over these things very roughly, but then the, and then the identity politics. This identity politics is not working. It's, it's disintegrating. <coughs> It's not integrating, it's disintegrating uh, all the oppositional energy. And people all around the world should think about this. And this, you know, who are we sleeping with, who are we making love to, should not be, you know, overshadowing our political determination or whatever, you know, our other identity, which is being the people who are being exploited and so on and so forth. 
so maybe good old fashioned class politics <laughs> would be, you know, remedy to our situation because it doesn't, you know, what we believe in, who we make love to, or what what color we are, whatever, all these things are not making us come together, but they, you know, split us into pieces, and those piece, pieces cannot function together. <laughs> We opened the door for the, this was ironic in <laughs> telling this in Croatia, but yeah. Should we open the floor for the yeah, sure. so if anyone has a question, please keep your hands up. Uh, I depressed everyone. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving up. Yeah, this is what Turkey makes you. Uh, what? Identity politics. Yeah. Um, um, there are many, you know, satirical literature on this. Actually, you know, um, people identifying themselves, branding themselves, and then they are becoming less and less. The groups are becoming smaller and smaller, and all they believe in is, you know, as, as you know, they identify being opposition with their personal identity which does not work, uh, it didn't work, and it does not work uh, right now in Turkey. Uh, what happened in Gezi, uh, which was the only successful oppositional action throughout the years uh, AKP ran Turkey, uh, what happened in Gezi was they all came together and they all left aside their identities and they came to say no to the things that made Turkey horrible today. I think this is uh, the, this is the this is the only way. Forget about your identity, you know, fluff, and then come together and say no the and be serious about this. Too much of individual uh, that as well. But then you know, being black, being yellow, being you know, transsexual, but then having I don't know something and something and something, you know. All these identity politics, it doesn't, it doesn't apply to the current situation. How it doesn't, um, I think, grasp the seriousness of the situation, political situation on a global level. Uh, well, uh, you, you seem very afraid and disappointed, and right to so. Uh, but uh, what does literature give you? Give you then? You know, it, it, it won't change the world, obviously, but. Uh, why, why is it political and what does it give, give to you or your readers? Um, my editor-in-chief in Turkey, um, I was telling her that I cannot write anything, anything that really make an influence and so on and so forth. And she being far more experienced than me, she, she talked about Latin American refugees, uh, refugee literature people like Cortazar or Neruda and so on and so forth who are coming to Europe or in, in any other refugee way um, in the human history that influenced literature. We talked about those things and she said literature, literature does not save the world, does not change the world. Literature can only save the good part of the um, human being and keep it for the coming generation. Um, well, I'm like, it seems like I am surrendering to the situation, but I do think that literature has the job to protect what's good in human being, what's good in a generation, and keep it, uh, keep it, save it, and tell it to the coming generation. I think this is what storytellers do. Okay, uh, you mentioned the women power in yeah. political. Uh, things in Turkey, and uh, do you think that the women are the first target of this, let's say, conservative or the, uh, oppressive societies, and then the, uh, that the women movement can do the maybe difference? Um, I don't think it, it's only the women. Uh, New Turkey, as I call it, um, um, defines the ideal citizen as Sunni Muslim, men, <coughs> conservative, and obedient. So if you are not one of these, or all of it together, you are the target of the 
political power. So being a woman, obviously, it does not fall into the ideal citizen uh, category. But then uh, when sense of law, sense of justice is disturbed in a country, uh, it's only, it's first the women, <laughs> children, animals, trees, nature, these are the ones that gets damaged first, before men, because they are the ones who needs the law and the justice and the system of law, the rule of law. Uh, and the most, uh, you know, the disenfranchised ones actually use uh, the rule of law. Therefore, if you remove rule of law from a, from a country, these are the groups that will get affected most. And obviously, women are in has have always been on the window dressing of countries. You know, when there is an ideological uh, project on massive scale, they use women. You know, this is uh, what we want women to look like. You know, be it socialist or Islamist, whatever. They only they first dress the women like the Barbie dolls. You know, we want this ideal woman. Uh, so women are exposed to the ideological changes uh, in that regard more than men, obviously, because you know, and especially in Turkey, you know, a man can carry the ideology within his his, his head, but then the woman has to carry it or not carry it on top of her head. Uh, so they they become more exposed to the changes, to the you know, to the clashes, to, to the political clashes. Uh, in, in Turkey, in, in today's, in, in the current situation, I do believe in women because they, every time when there is something really critical, they come to the political scene, uh, to the public sphere, and make themselves heard, no matter what. And it was very touching, actually. Uh, the other day, uh, I tweeted, uh, it's a video, and like, I would really want you to watch it, actually. <laughs> Women from the opposition party, CHB, the Social Democrats, well, CHB, the Social Democrats, invited all the women of Turkey, so many women from all different backgrounds and from all political wings. They went to parliament and they sang the song, uh, which is a very funny, it's not a song even, it's a slogan saying, it's, it's like, if women come together, uh, they can shake the world. And it was very touching to see in such a parliament that women can sing and you know, shout and so on and so forth. So it is um, that, you know, if you're seriously looking for hope, that is my only hope. Okay. Uh, sorry for not speaking so fluently English. Me neither. I'm I'm really so okay. But, uh, well, uh, I spent uh, five years in uh, Turkey, in Ankara specifically, mm. uh, in the early 19, 19th, uh, it's more than 20 years ago. Uh, and I felt uh, that Turkish people are very embarrassed when approaching Armenian question, especially Armenian question, what happened 100 years ago. <coughs> As a, one part of my colleagues were French, which are more provocative in their, <laughs> they put it directly some question, and I felt really sorry for people who, Turkish people who didn't know how to manage this question. And uh, so I was really pleased when reading your book this summer. And my question, my first question would be, have you? Uh, had some uh, difficulties and uh, as uh, approaching this question, <coughs> uh, can you get some difficulties which uh, government or official, I don't know, power or meanings or uh, actions? Mm -hmm. um, um, it, it's a difficult matter. Uh, Turkey, uh, it's not only Armenian question, but Turkey has this uh, amnesia thing. Uh, it's uh, the, the country is exercising, forgetting uh, so much so that what happened last week is ancient history to us. <coughs> this is how the political turmoil can be mm, so sustainable, I think. 
and I think the, the exercise of forgetting for Turkey has started with the Armenian question. Uh, it is the saddest story of human, one of the saddest stories of human history. And we, pre we like to pretend that it does not, uh, it's, it's not there, you know. It's not even forgetting, it is forgetting of forgetting. It is, you know, two levels of forgetting. Um, my difficulty was to see that even I, being the most, you know, open person to these things, one of the most open, let's say, if I, even I had some <coughs> barriers, obstacles, <coughs> I'm sorry, obstacles in my head when, you know, handling this issue. Um, and, you know, the book has become, therefore the book has become some sort of personal archaeology, you know, digging nationalism out of my head, you know, and trying to understand what, how it was put there and when and by whom. Because uh, people tend to think that ideas are their own invention, whereas actually they are implanted in their heads, you know, throughout education years. Uh, one difficulty was that, and in terms of you know reaction and sort that sort of thing, I didn't get many reactions because the book is, um, <coughs> you know, walking around the uh, G word genocide. It does not mention the word, and actually it's looking for a way to not use the word and keep on. Uh, the dialogue, keep on the conversation, keep on, you know, talking about this thing, telling the story. Uh, so it's uh, those folks who mention the word genocide always got more attention and more reaction. But I don't think that they in, they induce conversation in between Armenians and Turkish people. Therefore, I tried to write a book without the word, but with the entire story. Uh, in According, the, the reaction was not as strong as to those books who defended uh, that there is a genocide, who, you know, uh, and which uh, concentrated on the historical facts. And I, on the other hand, concentrated on how people tell the stories or how ca they cannot tell the stories of their past. It is mostly about, not about only Armenian issue, but about how memory is built and how we can um, get over the obstacles of um, memory barriers, let's say. Uh, second question would be almost the same. Uh, uh, I didn't notice in your book that this one was translated in the French. Uh, or uh, it's, trans it's translated here. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, uh, it's very, really... uh, very few people know about this matter. And in France, we have a huge community, Armenian community, especially <laughs> um, the chief for years and years was Charles Aznavour. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it, has it been no, tra no. translated in France? This, this, you know, these things, and uh, I am sure this country knows what I'm talking about. These matters, um, you know, complicated matters, create an industry on both sides, um, you know, uh, the victim and the oppressor, uh, both sides create their own industry. And if you're not talking with the discourse of, uh, n you know, neither of them, then you are on, uh, you know, you, you, you find yourself in this cross mm, firing, what is the word, you know, uh, nobody likes you. At the end of the day. So I am that person. Nobody likes me. Um, you know the Armenians who are very committed to their political convictions, or the Turks who are committed to you know their own convictions. They both hate me. So only those ones in the middle who want to talk about this, who want to tell their stories, would be interested in this book. And as you know, these people have been the minority throughout the human history. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, um, this is a question 
um, Oregon Public Readers should be discussing, I think. Uh, he's, he received a Nobel Prize and I think he, he, he did an amazing job for Turkish literature and language. And, and as for political convictions, I don't want to talk. Why not? Because I don't want to. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you started as a, I'm on a women topic again. So you started as a young uh, journalist and uh, we don't know the scene of uh, journalism in Turkey. Are there any young women journalists? With, because here in Croatia we have a very small but very strong and nice uh, feministic uh, journal journalist scene, so what about, oh, the, and the, politically engaged, very politically engaged, so what about Turkey situation? It's super strong, I mean, if you ask me, like, the, 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 you know, in order to survive in such circumstances, you have to be very, very strong and adaptable, resilient, and whatever you call it, therefore we young women of Turkey are very, very strong. Um, you know, those who are especially committed to feminist issues, and you know, as for newspapers, it's you know when you look at the um, working class of newspapers, it's all women. Only the decision makers are not <laughs> women. Probably but space. other than that, it is like I don't know. Uh, it's almost only women sometimes. <clears throat> the common part of the question. Um, uh, I would say that uh, the identity politics, as you define it, in Turkey is not uh, is not a problem as such. Okay? Uh, but, uh, but when you already mentioned it, uh, I would say that a much bigger challenge to understand is the question of identity politics in Turkey as uh, seen uh, through Kurdish question. Okay? Because uh, Kurdish question is the really authentic, is the really beside the main question, okay? Is the really authentic uh, identity question in, uh, in Turkey, okay? And uh, while being identity question, as you probably know, as everybody probably knows, is the question that it's not only a question of identity, okay, but it's also a supreme political question. Is the question of the formation of Turkish Republic, okay? Okay. On one side, on the other side, it's also a class question. Okay. Because Kurds in the 70s reinvented the whole story through the Marxism. Through Marxism. Okay. So, uh, while, while the Turkish socialists were supporting alternative regimes, okay, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's, the whole, that's the whole fun story. Okay. So, I, I'm glad that you said that, uh, there are some, that we are suffering from uh, this uh, since from before. But in that sense, how would you comment on the Kurdish question as a very serious uh, political question? Because uh, the, the whole idea, the whole idea was that uh, this influence, this influence uh, of uh, again, the Kurdish question has a giant potential, has a giant potential in changing the whole landscape of Turkish politics. For those who don't know about Kurdish politics as our friend here, as much as our friend here, uh, I'm going to make a very general comment about this. Um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, our president, is one of the most brilliant politicians that the modern human history has seen. Um, throughout his years of power, on different levels, he did one thing, which worked on the Kurdish question as well, very, very brilliantly. He made everyone, uh, every opposition voice, uh, representative of oppositional groups, let's say, sit with him at the same table, and when they left the table, they were discredited by the other opposition, parts of opposition. It, it's a very nice house of cards, uh, thing played in a more Middle Eastern style, of course. Uh, so, Kurdish politics, Kurdish movement, let's say, Kurdish party, did the same <coughs> thing and they were discredited by the Turkish left. It's a very long, very painful 
extremely uh, complicated story. But then um, I think what went wrong with Kurdish problem was that throughout 1990s, which was the date that I started being involved in these issues and you know following as a journalist. Throughout 1990s, it was a human rights issue, uh, not only for Turkish left, but also for European left. And then <coughs> after AKP came to power and after Syria happened, Kurdish issue became a Middle Eastern issue, which means dead end. And now it's Syria, it's Syria, <coughs> it's you know all this uh, Kurdistan, you know the uh, northern Iraq and so on and so forth. It's becoming uh, something that we cannot know of even. I am one of the pe I was one of the people who watched it, who followed it very closely, and now I don't have information because it's happening somewhere else in Middle East and within the Middle Eastern political context, which is impossible to know if you are not one of those men who are who's <coughs> playing the game. So, uh, but then uh, today, uh, one of my favorite uh, politician, uh, Kurdish politicians, Ahmed Turk, who has been an amazing person uh, in terms of peace negotiations and so on, and who has been a you know, personally very uh, powerful figure in Kurdish politics and in Turkish politics, uh, has been imprisoned. And this is uh, interesting, let's say, to say the least, that there is no uh, strong reaction, neither from the Kurdish side nor from Turkish left. So everything in, is in ruins in Turkey as a opposition. And everybody is so tired, so devastated, but mostly tired. And so nobody can make a effective noise about these things. And all the, you know, many political, Kurdish politicians have been in prison in the last month. And people pretend that it's not happening. And one can understand how 1915 happened by looking at today. Okay, so if there's no more... If I depress everyone, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we can all go home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe we should uh, conclude with something more optimistic. And I'm going to sing to you now. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Um, no, uh, okay. Read this one. This is, <laughs> this is not depressive. If you want to read something for me. Um, I, I do find strength in women. It's not like... Uh, cheesy sisterhood thing. It is more like um, women are the ones who have been exploited and pressured and oppressed throughout uh, 3,000 years. So we accumulated enough experience, I think, uh, what not to do. So I, I do think that the future of the world will be about women, most probably better than Hillary Clinton. <laughs> but you know, some better women uh, will be leading the change. And Orondoti Roy, one of my most favorite writer said, uh, which, you know, I, I said something similar very recently, so I find it very dear, her words very dear to me. Uh, he, she, she said, the change will come. It, it will be either bloody or beautiful. It depends on us. So, yeah, this is a nice thing, I think, to end up on a nice note. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.